Hello and welcome everyone back to another episode of the Publisher Lab. I'm Tyler Bishop and as you've probably come to expect on this show, it's fairly solo today except for my good friend producer Manny here. Producer Manny, welcome back. Hey, good to be back everybody. And we are talking about all things in the world of digital publishing today once again and I, I find that you know we sort of go through these cycles in publishing. We've talked ad nauseum before about how there's sort of like this cyclical trends of different types of things that go in and out of vogue. Um, some of it happens more so at the, I would say like kind of like upper echelon sort of uh, enterprise publishing advertising ecosystem uh, space where you're talk it's the types of things that come up at various advertising conferences and things like that, that are really not all that um, applicable in the real world, in my opinion, because it's it's a lot of talk, not a lot of action. Um, but then you also have these sort of like um, persistent like trends that I think are probably, if, if you made me guess, I'd probably say they're tied to global economic conditions. Um, but we find ourselves in several persistent ones that regardless of where the ebb and flow of uh, the trends are in digital publishing, um, they seem to have been here for a while. And uh, I'm talking about our good friends at Google first off, um, because it seems like for the last almost two decades, Google has been a thorn in the paw in some ways of publishers while also being one of their largest sources of traffic. Um, I'm sure that this podcast reaches listeners that are, um, I would say the majority of reliant on Google traffic if you're a publisher. Um, and where that sort of like is, you know, rubber meets the road where it's like more of a daily sort of like grind against the the, the behemoth in the tech space is is really SEO. And that's really where our first story comes from. And, and I, I've noticed a lot of hand wringing online about the most recent Google Core update. Uh, I can say that looking at a broader spectrum of data, it doesn't seem I mean, all Google updates, I feel like if you go and you look online, you're going to get this perception that it's been this massive impact one way or another. Um, they all, they never are. And you can go back and listen to some of the previous podcasts where I've talked about this. Um, but in this one, I've noticed that publishers um, seem to be quite a bit more inclined to um, lean into sort of this really niche sort of uh, belief that there's these odd sort of like specific things that Google has addressed. And um, I, I don't know that that's the case. And so I would be very weary of the advice that I follow out there. But producer Manny, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about these developments and what's going on with Google's October 2023 core update. Sure thing. So yeah, so if you, many of you noticed that Google unveiled uh, the twenty October 2023 broad core update, which is significant because that's the third of its kind this year, one in March and another one in August. And for publishers, if you do notice a drop in your rankings, Google suggests that it might not be a direct issue to your pages. And similar to what we were, we've been talking about on this podcast, and we had uh, Zach Ashman, our SEO guy here, don't take any immediate recovery actions because that could potentially further affect your page. Uh, what is interesting about this rollout is that it did come alongside a spam update as well. So it could even complicate it further on determining what the exact cause of the website rankings, but it is important that you keep an eye on your analytics for the next few weeks. Yeah, and I think if you if you look at this from a log logistical perspective on Google's end, Google is aware that the internet is being flooded with content at all times. Uh, and now that problem gets exponentially worse because if they're not clueless, they know that AI is writing a lot of content and just pumping it out there. And so they're trying to be, what I would guess is more discerning in some ways. Um, they're just like anything else that Google does uh, across the web and search engines, any small change has wide reaching effects. So. This is where I always tell people to be very careful about assuming, uh, you know, an update, you know, penalized this or that, because, I mean, a penalty is not really a thing um, from the standpoint of, you know, Google will tell you to have an actual penalty against your site in Search Console. Um, so the better way to look at it is, you know, what type of content do I have on my website and is it benefiting or is it, you know, 
is it behind the times, if you will, um, in terms of what people want? Because that's really where Google is trying to make very, very small adjustments is they're trying to align sort of the results that appear to what appears to be what people want from those results. So again, if you're focusing on Google, I think you're focusing on the wrong problem. I think focus on the people that your content is for. Um, I've never seen that lead someone astray. That being said, uh, producer Manny's right. Um, referencing uh, our good friend Zach, who was on the podcast a couple episodes ago, I'd recommend, especially right now, go back and check it out. Um, the biggest thing with it is I've seen so many sites over the years, um, and you know they hear about something that changed, and they see the traffic go down, or maybe it doesn't even go down. Maybe they, you know, like it's just, most of the time it's just seasonal. Um, but when you look at very small data points, so what I mean by small, I mean less than 50,000 visits. If your date range includes less than that, then you don't have enough data to make a determination. Now, you may have small data points that kind of fall into that category. Um, if that's the case, you need to be looking at year over year, at least a couple weeks, month is a lot better, but day over day, forget about it. You're not looking at something that's accurate enough unless your traffic is zero. Um, because even if there is this massive 50% drop in your mind, um, you know, I, I find that, you know, when you're looking at declines, the percentages are always rounded up. And when you're looking at growth, percentages are always run, uh, rounded down. Um, but the biggest thing that I would look at with that is be careful about your date ranges because Google's updates are usually not something that you can pinpoint by looking at your traffic. And the biggest thing that I would look, and what I mean by that is, specifically is that if you're looking at your traffic day over day, there's all kinds of different little factors that may be messing you up there. So a longer date range where you can kind of pick a period in time where you're like, okay, this is kind of the period that I think Google made some kind of change in. And the prior period being, you know, before that, you want to look at maybe like a two week window before and after. And that way you can look inside a search console, you can pull up your queries and then you can sort them by rank and then you can do a comparison period. And you can actually see like which queries or pages are the ones that have been hit the hardest. Rarely, if it's an algorithm update or something like that, do you find that it's just like every page is 20 percent down or something like that? Um, normally what I see is that it's not algorithmic at all. It's usually seasonal. Um, and you'll see a decline in one or two keywords or phrases usually attached to the same page. And when you go and you look at that, and if you look at year over year, that exists every year, there's, you know, school starts. And so kids aren't looking at, you know, like math guides or, or they are looking at math guides and they weren't before or something like that. Um, and the biggest thing with looking specifically at like those pages and those queries, if you do see a across the board decline and it's not seasonal and you do have both of those windows, um, you may want to take a look at just basically like all those different queries, maybe the ones that get the most traffic and then look in search results. And there's all kinds of different tools and websites out there that'll tell you if the results have shifted very much, but you can also see your own rank. And one of the things that uh, I would be very careful about is if you see that your traffic declines, but your rank hasn't declined, then it's not Google. I mean, it's not Google from a rankings perspective. It's right there in front of your face. So the biggest like identifier is to look at search console and look at your rankings with a decent time period before you do anything. Otherwise you're guessing you're taking awful advice from people on the internet that are using parroted information from other people on the internet that none of which have any really hard firm data or knowledge of exactly what's going on and you're going to apply a solution to a problem that likely doesn't exist and i and i find that that actually does so much more harm than than google itself uh to publishers it's these self-inflicted things so um that's my little, little tangent today on seo and i know there's lots of them and I know that that doesn't, you know, fix a problem today. But if you if you actually go and apply some of the things that I've mentioned uh, specifically in terms of looking at data, uh, I can promise you you'll you'll 
be better off in the long run, and you'll probably learn something about your site that helps you quite a bit. Producer Amanda, but Google, we're not done with Google today. We've actually got them quite a bit. So switching gears here a little bit more towards Gmail. Um, what what has Google done recently to, uh, you know, in their minds, improve the quality of Gmail or email overall? So we're going to see a big change with Gmail uh, starting in February 2024. Uh, Gmail users can now expect less spam emails. Google announced stricter rules for bulk senders, which classify, which are classified as uh, those that send 5,000 emails to Gmail addresses in one day. And it's going to require them to authenticate emails and then provide easier unsubscribe options. And this move does aim to strengthen Google's defenses against unwanted emails and phishing threats. And additionally, Google is collaborating with industry partners like Yahoo to set policy, to set these policies as industry norms. So I'm sure uh, I'm getting, you know, tens of spam emails every single day. And I feel like it's only ramped up get, more in I, the last few months. I get in the hundreds. I promise you in the Oof. hundreds. Uh, and all of those emails you're going to have to sift through or do you usually just filter them out? You know, uh, I've I've gotten to the point now where across all the inboxes and things like that that I have both personally and professionally, uh, I do nothing with them. Uh, if my my email to reach me by email is a miracle these days. And um, I remember the kind of the point a couple of years ago, wherever I was just like, it's, I can't even try to organize these things, but you know, any OCD that I have about inbox zero or anything, it's like, I got to throw that out the window because realistically it's like, you know, with the phishing threat, I think is real. And then also you can make the argument as well that sales outreaches and things like that. It, I, I don't think that those things are, are bad things, but I do think that especially with AI now um, it's very hard to tell, like, you know, essentially, you know, if you have an AI bot that's just churning out emails and, you know, sending emails off to people, that's illegal, but it's very difficult to be able to, you know, find that and identify it. And, you know, with the use of VPNs and all the different things you can do in the cloud now, um, you know, there's just too many sophisticated ways to just blow up, you know, inboxes across the world. And so I, I, I gotta say from a user and an ecosystem perspective, I kind of applaud this effort a little bit just because it's it's needed. Email is a very effective sort of communication line and we use it personally for so many things. Um, you know, like your e you think about your email is like the one thing that is used for logins, for, um, you know, it's a central identifier. It's what they call a key value key. So across like multiple devices, across multiple services and things like that your email is this like unique identifier that's you and it's something that's public so like a social security number is like that too but your social security number is something that you have privately emails are relatively public and so i i do like the idea of finding ways to standardize this sort of thing so that um there's more accountability and and uh, I guess adherence to uh, the laws that we already have in place that are very hard to enforce. Um, but I also, you know, look at this with a fair amount of skepticism because it is Google, not skepticism in terms of like their effort to actually improve this. I think they'll try. Um, it's sort of like it just so happens to be extremely convenient that they are this massive email like both server and technology provider to a large part of the world. And on top of that, they make a significant amount of money from advertising, uh, of which is, you know, essentially, uh, I guess it's a little bit cannibalized by the ability for somebody to spam your email inbox, right? Like if salespeople can't contact you and blow up your inbox, um, you know, like then you potentially would have to advertise to get those emails across. You can almost think about this as like Google's way of uh, reducing reach in the same way that Facebook or somebody like that did in the feed. So um, yeah, I, I, glass half empty, glass half full on this one, just because um, yeah, Google is going to, um, I, I don't like what I think is the Google intention behind it, but I do like the, the consolidated effort to improve email. Um, and I, I think AI has certainly accelerated the problems that we have there. Um, but 
Speaking of AI, um, AI and AI news, Adweek was talking this week a little bit more about these. Uh, or, well, yeah, is that our next story, Producer Manor? We've got You've got something else that says. Yeah, so we actually have one more Google news story. Can't, okay. Can't get enough of Google today. Uh, so this this came out after Wired published an article alleging that Google would delete search queries. And oh, that's them right. Yeah. With better monetized ones. Uh, Google's Danny Sullivan and Ginny Mar- Marvin have refuted the claims that the tech giant alters search queries for increased monetization. Sullivan took to Twitter to clarify that organic search results remain unaffected by the ad system. And Marvin further emphasized that while advertisers can control where their ads appear, this doesn't influence organic search outcomes. And I think this is a big issue right now because Google is currently doing the antitrust trials and they said that their uh, organic search department and their ads department and sales department were completely separate. Um, yet that it turns out that they are still manipulating those uh, ad rates. So this is something where you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt just because it seems like Google has lied in the past. Yeah, so uh, you and I were talking about this before the show. And um, uh, prior to that, uh, so I know Jenny and Danny both. I knew them long before they worked at Google. They were on on our side of the fence. I say our because, you know, I'm I'm thinking from the perspective of a a publisher and everybody on the outside of Google that relies on them. Um, They were journalists in this space. So they made good sense for Google to be sort of like the mouthpiece for many of the things that um, you know, their perspectives in the space and things like that. And so, you know, I would be careful in being too hard on them because I do think that, you know, they, they know what it's like to be on our side of the fence, uh, with Google. Uh, that being said, um, regardless of where it comes from Google, you have to realize, and this actually, I, I heard from somebody that worked there, um, for a long time. And he said, because I was giving him a hard time about something else that Google always talked about, which was like the, you know, the impact of a subdomain versus a uh, root domain uh, for SEO. And, you know, when he answered my question, whenever I kind of like had the chance to kind of like, you know, really hammer him on it, um, you know, he, he conceded that the question that I was asking about like, you know, does Google treat them differently? Of course, they're two different websites even though they have the same root domain, one's a sub. Um, if they're completely different websites, then they're going to be treated like completely different websites. And I had to get very, very specific for him to give me the answer that I was seeking from that. And the reason was, is because Google will take these questions that when when they're asked, do Google, does advertising influence or affect rankings at all? No, I, I zero doubts about whether or not that happens they are they are they letting advertising what's happening on that side of the building change the decisions or something on the search algorithm side of the building or how that works at all no now if your question was has google perhaps made or been influenced by hear me out the roadmap for search and where it's headed and or maybe even just sort of like the you know way that it operates is that potentially maybe guided by self-interest that google would have in advertising well i think you could make the argument that there are a lot of really interesting things that align that you know sir seemingly would serve both google and the user so a good example is if your query is you know something very specific like um what whirlpool refrigerator is you know most likely to be recalled in the next two years it's a long query um but maybe the you know modification is whirlpool recalls last two years right that's a more popular query it probably also has more advertisers bidding on it for a lot of reasons so yes Google maybe like is only doing that change because it's like trying to align where they can better optimize for results that are more standardized and common. So they're going to, they're going to, you know, make those changes based on that. But does that also happen to increase the amount of advertiser competition for the query? 
It does. So like it serves two interests there. Now, the real problem becomes whenever you can serve that Google interest and maybe you're serving the user interest, but there's maybe multiple other ways that you could serve the user interest. And if it always seems to be the one that aligns to your business interests, then you start to have these questions about uh, legality and also once again about antitrust. So um, once again, Google, I, I, I will um, contend to the day I die that they're very specific about what they say and they, they're not going to lie to your face in most cases. Um, the cases that you can kind of like maybe point to where you're like, I'm sure that they have. Uh, they're definitely in court over that. And I promise you that they're arguing that that's not what was asked or that's not what was said. Um, and it's because they think about this stuff way, way ahead of time. And that's that's also where you run into these antitrust questions about like, you know, if you're looking 10 years down the road, are you making decisions that sort of like serve your interests then uh, that seem benign now? Um, we'll see. Um, but before uh, I forgot that we had more Google on the menu, I was starting to get into this story from Adweek about uh, Messenger pens and uh, this AI partnership that they uh, tell us a little bit more about this producer, Manny. I, I found this a very interesting story to begin with. Yes. So the, the Messenger, which is a news publisher that launched earlier this year, has teamed up with an AI company Seeker in a multi-million or in a multi-year partnership. And their goal is to eliminate news bi or bias in news reporting. Seeker's tools will help journalists at the messenger spot and rectify instances of clickbait, subjectivity, or personal opinion. And the articles will be scored based on their political lean, reliability, ensuring that readers and advertisers get unbiased content. Unbiased content. This move is, to, is a step towards unbiased reporting in today's partisan media landscape which is gonna be very interesting because I know that Google recently uh, uh, was pushing their helpful articles uh, initiative. So this is something that could potentially focus on that. So this is a problem that uh, a lot technology has tried to solve here more recently, um, but uh, has been uh, a goal uh, for humanity for as long as news has existed. and. So I want to point out that I think that this is a unsolvable problem because it's a human problem and it's a it's the we're focusing on the wrong problem here, meaning um, not to say that there isn't value in sort of these efforts and what that looks like for people. Um, this idea that you can make news fair. I remember in journalism school um, learning a lot about like what what it takes to be, quote unquote, fair and balanced, because news in of itself and journalism in of itself is a practice much in the same way a doctor or somebody like that would would go through a practice is they call it practicing medicine or practicing whatever because you're you're actually practicing it, this is not something that is a it's not the science that you think that it is from the standpoint of like you can arrive at this completely unbiased sort of like take on a subject because the very fact that it is news infers a bias um, so a good example is uh, the current conflict in uh, Israel um, happened over the weekend. And uh, this is significant news and information for the globe. But underneath that, like no one is, most people will not disagree that that is a significant development. However, that infers that all of us view that these global conflicts are something that is of supreme importance yeah war war is devastating it's it, it it's really challenging um you know the the normative sort of like perceptions that we have on a daily basis of what it means to be human what it means to be compassionate however if you can make the argument that to me living in southern california i'm very unaffected by it and so because of that you know, is that news for me? So is that a significant development? Maybe not, maybe so. It dev depends on my personal values and beliefs and how I think, you know, of something that's significant to me. So every single human being has these inherent sort of like value structures that we have 
And that's how we place importance on information in general. So journalism is taking the average of that, inferring those biases, and then the news itself, regardless of whether or not an opinion is underlined through it, we've already kind of got that. And I remember at the start of the pandemic, I really wanted just neutral information. So I subscribed to a service that did something very similar to this. And I canceled the subscription after about two weeks because I found it to be less informative because I couldn't even get, I could barely get the bulk. It was like just the summary outline of kind of like news and info. And I found that to be unhelpful because I actually sort of think that part of what you get out of news that's valuable is these like leaning biases or whatever. Um, echo chambers are dangerous. We all know that. But we also, you know, can think of in our minds what we think of as a biased source of information for one way or the other. And when you go and you read that, you get a perspective. And that perspective sort of like allows you to sort of put into a lens of like, well, I think they might be right about this, but maybe wrong about that. And then you could go read the opposite and you could say, OK, well, I think they have a great point about that. And I didn't think about this other thing. And then you're sort of left with your own perspective based once again on your values and beliefs. And so um, I don't think this is a problem for AI to solve. And I think, uh, you know, I know this has been something that has been discussed a lot. Publishers using AI to sort of like um, dehumanize their content is the way that I think of it. And I, I, I'm, I'm not very optimistic about the A, that I think that that'll be effective and that people really want that. But B, I, I just, I don't know that we should be trying to solve that problem. I don't know, Producer Manny, this is a philosophical one. What do you think? It's an interesting perspective. Uh, immediately when I hear this, it makes me think like, oh, we're just going to give the facts. Some similar to that, like a C-SPAN. It sounds great. Yeah. Right. On paper, it sounds great. Now, will it be effective? And just kind of leaning into what you said, since we all have human biases and it's important to be able to read things on both sides and then be able to make our own opinion based off of what we read, this is going to, in some ways, take take that away because we won't be able to see what other people are thinking and yeah. why they're thinking that. It's just, you know, cut and dry A to B. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 a sticky problem. It's not a clean one. And, um, you know, uh, I heard uh, Sam Altman say recently that um, AI is going to do a lot of good, but that doesn't mean no harm. And I think that's a great way to think about it because you could that statement is very is almost certainly to be true and you could say the same thing about the industrial revolution the invention of the internet you know every innovation has consequences and those things are a spectrum of good and bad you can think about like uh, industrial farming you know like i mean it gets a very bad rap these days because you can think about sort of like the food trade and food waste and all kinds of stuff um, and the number and the number of animals that are harmed and something like that. However, starvation um, and people having enough food is a relatively new in terms of human history development. And so, um, yeah, a lot of good for for humans, but with, not without its seedy underbelly. And I think AI is going to um, have a very similar path, but. Um, the you know how much good and how much bad. I think it, it's going to be determined a lot by um, sort of the arbiters of like the innovation, and a lot of that is going to come from big tech. And so I think it very much deserves and is getting probably the right amount of attention right now as to you know like what are these you know companies doing and what are they building and how are they planning to use it uh, and what evidence do we have right now that they're headed in the right or the wrong directions and that's. And that's, you know, where our last story really comes from. So we have big tech struggles to turn AI hype into profits. And this is a Wall Street Journal article. Um, Producer Manny, Manny, sorry, tell us a little bit more. Absolutely. So big tech companies, including Microsoft, Google and Adobe, are diving deep into generative AI tools. We've all seen these tools be released throughout the year. These tools are capable of producing content like business memos and computer code, uh, but they do come with a hefty price tag due to the need for the powerful servers and chips that they require. 
And while these companies are launching AI-backed software upgrades with higher cost, users are expressing dissatisfaction. And the future profitability of these AI tools remains uncertain. And as tech advances, companies are hopeful that this cost will decrease. Investors, meanwhile, are treading cautiously despite the buzz around AI. So yeah. AI does require a lot of power for it to be able to operate properly. Um, so we are going to start seeing an increase in subscription fees and price tags for these new AI tools as uh, as we move forward just to try to like circumvent some of these hefty costs. Um, it's going to be really interesting because I feel like the trajectory of AI has been so massive. And with a, f a story that we had a few weeks ago where ChatGPT, the numbers of daily users were s slowing down. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how that affects Maybe it dips after the prices go up. People are saying, you know what? It's nice that this thing is writing all of my newsletters, but do I really want to pay the price? For yeah. It? And and to be honest, um, you know, we've gotten, you know, every trend that we've experienced from a technology cost perspective here recently, especially on the web, web-based things, ever since uh, lightweight technologies in the cloud have come along, um, you know, it's been it's been a revelation because you think about what you used to pay for like a, you know, a copy of uh, the Adobe creative, what, what is now the Adobe creative suite back in the day. And you're talking about thousands of dollars for a CD ROM and a license to use the, the technology. And now, you know, for a very small monthly fee, you can access it on the web from anywhere on any device. And I, and I think that that has led us to um, in some, some respects, not necessarily recognize uh the hidden costs of things like that we've talked before about you know the hidden costs of quote unquote free email uh free storage free um my wife and i this weekend uh i was uploading a bunch of uh photo photos that were very high res to our uh apple icloud and, and she was asking if um you know we wanted to upgrade our storage in the cloud and she's like oh it's so cheap how, how can you they make you know a couple terabytes of storage, you know, just a couple dollars a month. And I was like, well, you're not accounting for the fact that it might not, they might lose money on that. And she was like, yeah, but why would they want to lose money on just me storing all this stuff? And you'll notice in your iPhone settings, there's all these things where it's like, allow us to scan and improve based on, you know, the contents of your iCloud. And, you know, there was that story about a year ago where maybe it was two years ago where Apple was, you know, and this this is the best, you know, I guess, uh, altruistic form of using this. They were scanning photos that were inside of, you know, stored in the iCloud for, uh, you know, uh, child pornography. And they were using that information to to send to the federal authorities, those that were maybe storing you know, that illegal content on on their servers. So while you can applaud that and you can say, well, that's obviously something that, you know, does good in the world. It does beg the question of like, well, I'm not accounting for the fact that like they're charging me by using all of you know my content or my information or my data or my files or my whatever I put in their cloud, and they're using it as you know, maybe you upload a bunch of stuff to the iCloud, and and Apple is training their machine learning on it. How is that different than you know somebody stealing you know like something off of my computer that I've created um, and then using it for an Apple product. It's very similar if you really think about it. If I write a computer program and then a guy at Apple hacks into my computer, finds out what I did, and then they use it to build an Apple product, then yeah, that's, that's stealing. Um, they've taken something from me. There's a value to that. Now, if the pictures that I take of my family go into the iCloud and the machine learns on it and they use that to better identify what's a picture of a family versus what's a picture of a group of friends, um, that's, that's the same outcome. So I think that getting used to paying for this sort of thing um, is a good idea. Um, getting used to being able to understand there's, there's costs associated with this you giving data and information that was the last revolution now you need something so these big tech giants needed something from users before and that's how they you know built these empires 
But now they want to provide something back to the users that they got from them to begin with. And that's artificial intelligence. And because there's no value in providing versus taking, they're going to have to charge what this cost is. And with, I mean, even as chip technology advances as fast as it does, the computing power needed for good machine learning, that that's only going to increase. There's all these, you know, sophisticated ways that they can go about distributing this and things like that. But at, at its core, machine learning, artificial intelligence takes a lot of computing power. And that's just a lot of power in general. And that has a cost. Go ask the Bitcoin miners out there in the world that, um, you know, like we're buying up all these factories and stuff and found out that the biggest, you know, hindrance to whether or not they could be profitable was their power bills. Um, it, it's expensive. And I think that that's something that um, individual consumers, we haven't had to think about because, you know, storage and different things like that are low computing cost and, you know, provided relatively free because there's an ancillary benefit to these empires. So AI is something that I feel we probably need to be paying for. And social media, Meta and Facebook, they've talked about ad-free versions uh, popping up here recently as well. And I think that if you look closely at paying for things, um, social media, news, these things have a model that have persisted for a long time and they're likely to endure. I don't anticipate that changing. Um, I don't think social media outlets will be successful with this. But if you look at things that are provided to you that provide value to your life, those things are things we've traditionally paid for and AI is one of them. Um, that being said, caveat here, do as I say, I guess, not as I do. Uh, although I do, most of these do have a paid version of them as well. But uh, one of the things we wanted to start highlighting on this show are AI or like innovative technologies that you can actually use. So I I don't know any other person other than myself that uses as many new tools and technologies. It's a, it's as much a hobby as it is something that I, I do as a part of my career. Um, but I would say uh, the bookmarks inside of my, my Chrome browser and uh, all the different places that I save and bookmark links um, can fill a stadium um, because I'm just always finding new things and applications for them. And most of them have, you know, wide reaching sort of benefits to different types of publishers. So we want to highlight one uh, each week on the show and hopefully you enjoy it. So if you go to publisherlab.org, I'd love your feedback. I, I like doing new segments. I like being able to expose people to, you know, new technologies that I like, that I think are cool. Uh, there's zero uh, self-interest in this other than I, I like to share things and teach. And, um, and so uh, we're going to try to highlight at least one per show. If you're like, that's my favorite thing about the show, please let us know. If you're like, no, cut all that crap out. I really just like staying up to date on the industry. Stick to the news. That's great too. Um, so this week, uh, the tool that I'm highlighting is called Pico Apps. It's P-I-C-O-A-P-P-S dot X-Y-Z. So Pico Apps dot X-Y-Z. And this is basically like a, it's a generative AI product that allows you to write a short description of a micro, what they call it like a micro app um, or my, not micro SaaS because it's not a subscription based thing that you're going to sell, but it will, it can create things like calculators or um, conversion tools or image resizers or uh, producer Manny found one that was a slot machine, which I, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, it was super cool. It made like a bunch of little uh, web-based apps. Um, there were some great ones that are powered by Google Sheets as well. So if you wanted to have like a truth or dare party game, uh, you just go to this website uh, that's made by Pico and then it just automatically works on your phone, almost like an app without having to download anything. So there's a bunch of cool apps that you can, you can try out and check out. Yeah, and what's cool about it is that you're literally just typing in, you know, like you would tell like an engineer something simple that you wanted to build and it'll build a little one page app for you. And what's cool about this, if you're a publisher is think about whatever your niche is or the category that you publish in and think about like what are little tools or calculators or, um, you know, like e even just ways of displaying or visualizing information or content on your website 
that could be made interactive if you had a page or a little app that automatically, you know, showed somebody whenever you travel from, you know, how many airplanes are in the air a day or something like that. And you could visualize it in many different ways. And, you know, you could tell, make me a tool that visualizes, you know, the number of airplanes that fly in the sky a day. Um, and it may ask questions. It may ask you, well, where can I find that information or something like that? You can just give it a link or whatever. And bam, there you go. You've got this really great piece of content that I wouldn't say SEO proof, but you know, these things that have real value, you don't have to worry about all the little, you know, content based SEO things that exist out there, uh, that you may be worried about because the value is inherent to the user. And I think this is something that I would take a closer look at if I was a publisher is, you know, how can I make my content more interactive? How can I make it better? How can I provide, you know, a value or a service via my content or my expertise to my audience? And if you're not tech savvy at all, something like this makes it really, really easy because like producer Manny said, you're just bootstrapping it. If you need a database or you need to get the data or store the data somewhere, you can use a Google sheet and you can, you know, essentially just type out what you need. And if it's almost right, but not quite, you can then go back and change your prompt and, you know, seemingly fix that, that problem. Um, but I, I found a couple of really cool things for it that, um, that, that I think have a benefit and hopefully you check it out and enjoy it as well. Producer Manny, anything else on that? Uh, yeah. So this is going to be a new segment. Uh, we have a huge list of AI tools and we'll give out some suggestions every week to see if, uh, you know, maybe we'll spark some ideas. And if anyone does use any of these tools, we'd love to hear how, uh, what you think about it. Yeah, please send them my way. Use. Yes. Uh, publisherlab.org. Uh, any information, uh, YouTube comments as well, or the comments of any podcast service. Uh, and we'll see you guys next week. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks, everybody. And we'll catch you next time on The Publisher Lab.